Good morning, ladies. Good morning. How are we doing today? We're doing good. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, I'm so happy to see you all. We're all here to just worship and to have a wonderful time with our Father and with each other in fellowship today. So um, I'm going to pray over us. Just as I'm praying, if you have your cell phones, just put them on vibrate or turn them off, whatever you got to do to just have a special individual time with the Lord. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are just true through and through, Father. We thank you that your word is available to us, that we can open it and read it at any time. And Lord, we know that it's your living word. Lord, it's not just words on a page, it's life, Lord Jesus. So I just pray this morning, Lord, that that's exactly what, as as Linda just comes forward and gives the message, Lord, that it would be life that we're receiving by your Holy Spirit, Lord, through your name. And Lord, as we just come to worship you, we just we just love you, and we love that we get to worship you, that we get to praise your name, Lord. It's such a joy to praise your name in song and sing to our Father. So I just pray that you would receive these praises, Lord, that you would just inhabit our praises. Jesus, we just love you, and we thank you that we are, again, just in your house, getting ready to praise your name, Lord. Thank you for thank you for everything that you do for us, and thank you for calling us yours. In your mighty name, we pray these things. Amen. Yeah. 
you have given me the opportunity and need to succeed by your righteous resurrection and death you die for me Die! 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing it again. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. The way, the way. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness.
of one of you ladies holding on to a promise that God gave to you, don't let go. Because he's moving and he's working and he's growing in you and he's showing you. He will fulfill what he told you he will fulfill. Just remember that he is the promise keeper. He is the miracle worker. And it's all for his glory and for his name's sake. So when it comes, glorify him fully. He deserves every ounce of glory. just learned this last song yesterday, but I feel like it ministered to me so much, and I pray that if you ladies know it, you'll just lift it up with me. It's, it's a hymn my mom showed me, but I might need you to lead me in a little worship. <laughs> so please, if you know it, just sing it with me. I cast all my cares Thank you so much that you are the way maker, Lord. I just, you're the way, Lord. You are the way, the truth, the life, Lord. So we just honor you this morning and we thank you for your goodness in our lives, for your faithfulness, for always revealing yourself, Lord, for always working, Lord Jesus, working in the midst, working behind the scenes. You're so good. So Lord, as Linda just comes, Lord, to give the word, would you just fully speak through her, Lord? Hold nothing back, Lord Jesus. Just speak through her by your Holy Spirit and let it just, just be a beautiful morning in your word, Lord, in your spirit, Lord Jesus. We thank you so much and we just ask your will be done, Lord, in each of our hearts and our lives and in definitely the message this morning. In your mighty name we pray, Lord. Amen. 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 Oh, what a beautiful time of worship. You know, when I came and sat down this morning, um, I sat in that seat over there. And the minute I sat down, I had such a feeling of peace come over me. And just actually, it was like a restful, it felt restful. And I just started praying for you guys that that would happen to you today. I feel like the worship was just in keeping with that, just peaceful and worshipful. So we just thank you, God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Spirit, that you are here with us today. Your peace is in this place. Your spirit is in this place. Lord, you invite us this morning just to rest, just to lay down. You invite us to lay down. I pray, God, within each one of us, we would lay down. 
even just that last song. Lord, I, as we were singing, I cast all my cares upon you. I prayed, let them do it right now. Let us be doing it right now. We cast our cares upon you. The big things we just have no idea what to do about. And even the little tiny silly things that are just driving us crazy. Lord, we just cast it upon you. You care for us. That's why we can do it, because you care for us. And so, Father, we cast all our cares, our concerns. We rest in your presence. Lord, you are here. You're with us. Just um, breathe. Just breathe on us today, we pray. Spirit of the living God, it's in your name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's so good to see all of you guys here today. It's so good to be inside. I remember a year ago standing at this podium and speaking to it in an empty room <laughs> because we couldn't be here. And it was just about a year ago that, that this all, all this stuff kind of came down, right? And um, I just wanted to say one thing. We're going to be either in the sanctuary or out in the, um, in the amphitheater as the weeks go by. So if it's a, just a gorgeous day, just kind of peek around the corner and see if it looks like we're outside. And if it's chilly, we'll be in here. So we're probably not going to return to 216 this year, but we'll, so we'll be in one of the two places. Just look and you'll find us. So we're in chapter 12, another awesome chapter of Romans. I just, are there any that aren't awesome? They're all so good. Um, and I, I've done something I've never done before as far as my title. I, I like to give my messages a title, um, but I've actually also given it a subtitle. <laughs> That's a first for me. <laughs> but I have entitled this chapter, 12 of Romans, Kingdom Living, slash, this is the subtitle, Abundant Life. Because I feel like, I know it's like probably, I was thinking, would anybody think that title fit with this chapter? But it totally does fit. This is kingdom living, what we see in Romans 12. And kingdom living is abundant living, yeah. right? Amen. So I read a um, quote in the book, Jesus Calling, um, this last week. And I've shared it with several friends because it just, it hit me. It was just so, this is like doing feedback. Is, is there a little bit yeah. of feedback? Um, it was just so, to me, it was just so, such a good word. And I'm just going to start my message with this word this morning before we jump into the scripture. Um, this is what it said. Knowing that your future is absolutely assured can leave you free to live abundantly today. Amen. Now I'm going to say that again. And if you take notes, write that down because that is like one of those things you want to keep in your Bible. <laughs> Because there's a promise there and something we can grab hold of and actually let it be part of our living today. Knowing that your future is absolutely assured can leave you free to live abundantly today. What does that look like for you to live abundantly this day? Think about what's happening next, where you're going next, who you're meeting with today, who you're going to see, what you're going to do. Can you take that thought into everything about your day that you're free to be an abundant, generous, giving person today? Isn't that a good word? That blessed me so much. Paul has taken 11 chapters out of a 16 chapter letter. And I know even as Alexander said, they weren't chapters, but he's taken um, I don't know what the equation there would be, but like three-fifths or four-fifths or something like that of this chapter to show us and to convince us that in Christ, our future is absolutely secure and absolutely assured. Remember, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. That one sentence alone told us the whole story. So he's taken this huge portion of this book, of this letter, to convince us that we are secure, that we're secure. And so now he takes us forward for the rest of this book. We've turned a corner in chapter 12 to show us what kingdom li living actually looks like. This is what it looks to be like to be a child of the kingdom. Now, I just finished the book of Psalms. 
And I spent a year in the book of Psalms, and I know it because last week I shared this at a, a prayer meeting I was at, or a prayer group, um, that I remember at that group something that happened a year ago, and it was right when we shut down, that stirred my heart to get into the Psalms. And so here we are a year later, and I just turned the last page of Psalms. To, I think it's Psalm 150. And when I turned that page, and I left that page, I turned right into Proverbs, right? Because that's the next book. And I looked there and I thought, I'm going to read Proverbs too because it is so good. We could read Proverbs, you know, every, one proverb every day and, and really be blessed. But um, I felt like that's kind of like what we did in Romans. As we leave chapter 11 behind and what Paul taught us, it, that was the heart of things. Like Psalms is the heart of things. And now we turn into 12 and we get into the Proverbs. The Proverbs of the book of Romans. Proverbs 1, I want to read this because it tells us something that I think applies to our chapter today. It begins with these words. Here are kingdom revelations, words to live by, and words of wisdom given to empower you to reign in life. These words, words of wisdom are given to empower us to reign in life, written as proverbs by Israel's King Solomon, David's son. Within these sayings will be found the revelation of wisdom and the impartation of spiritual understanding. Use them as keys to unlock the treasures of true knowledge. Isn't that amazing? Those who cling to these words will receive discipline to demonstrate wisdom in every relationship and to choose what is right and just and fair. And I feel like that's how Proverbs begins, but I feel like that's what apply, that applies to Romans chapter 12. Now listen to Romans uh, 1 verse 9. Um, and this is so good. It's actually in 1 9 in Proverbs, he's speaking of words of wisdom, but the words given out through your parents. You know, words that your father taught you, things that your mother gave you. Um, so at this point, but it's the words of wisdom, and we think of Paul as being a spiritual father, giving us in Romans 12 these words of wisdom. And it says this in Proverbs 1 9 Indeed, they are a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. Isn't that beautiful? Words of wisdom are a graceful wreath about your head and ornaments about your neck. I thought that was such a beautiful word picture describing the result of wise living. It beautifies you. It's a graceful wreath around your head. It's not only better when you live wise, it's not only better for everyone around you, and it is, but it actually makes you beautiful. And don't we know that's true? Don't we see that? Don't you just see the beauty in other believers in Christ? You see Jesus coming through them. Living wise beautifies us. So now in chapter 12, Paul begins with the word therefore. And in other words, what he's going to say now as we enter this chapter hinges on all that he has said up until this point in time. Therefore, because of all I've told you about who you are in Christ and about the security that you have in Christ, nothing can separate you from Christ. Because of all that... I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. The Passion Translation begins with a question. Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? What should be our response? It's like the question of the psalmist. What shall I give unto the Lord for all he's done for me? And remember what the answer was. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And so Paul asks a question just like the psalmist. What should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies as we've just heard of them and studied them all these weeks since October, these last 11 chapters? In other words, based on all that we now know about Jesus Christ, how then shall we live? That's a famous book by Francis Schaeffer, How Then Shall We Live? That's the great question. And the answer is in chapter 12, verse 1. Surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifices. 
and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart, for this becomes your genuine expression of worship. You know, for a while, Romans 12, 1 was kind of a mantra for me. Maybe you've gone through a spell like that where you just kind of took that and used it. I would use it in prayer meetings. I lay myself down, Lord, as a living sacrifice, often in prayer um, with the leaders in the morning. We lay ourselves down as living sacrifices in the morning for a period of time. Every morning, I'd say, I lay myself down, Lord, this morning as a living and holy sacrifice, which is my spiritual service of worship acceptable to God. It's acceptable to God. The living sacrifice that we lay down, our life, is acceptable to God. And it's our response for all he's done for us. This act of giving myself to God each day to be used according to his will for that day. Not my will, but his. There's where it gets rough. It's my living sacrifice. The sacrifice is my life. It's me. It's my life. The sacrifice itself isn't necessarily holy, right? It's a holy sacrifice. The sacrifice itself isn't necessarily holy. In my flesh, in my life, it isn't necessarily, I'm not necessarily holy. I am because God sees me as holy, but I'm talking about the, the fleshly me. But it's, but even though that is true, it's an acceptable sacrifice to God. My, li my life is an acceptable sacrifice to God, and it's my genuine expression of worship. Do you ever think of your ordinary human life as a genuine expression of worship? We don't think that way very often. You might think if you read your Bible that morning and you said your prayers, then maybe, maybe it is. Or you might think that if you were an extra good girl that day, then your life was a holy and acceptable sacrifice. But this isn't actually about goodness. This is actually about surrender. You know, when there were altars made to the Lord in the Old Testament, some of you will remember this from studying the Old Testament, they were to be made with uncut stones. Stones that had not been enhanced in any way by human hands. Stones that had had no um, tool wielded on them. That's how it said in the Old Testament. They were to be stones, raw stones, just as they came out of the quarry. That's what the altars were made of. And we lay ourselves down, of course, on the altar. We're like those uncut stones that make up the altar. And while we're here, we're also that living sacrifice that is laid on the altar. We're kind of like both. We're the uncut stones and we're that living sacrifice. The uncut, unperfected stones that make up the temple of the living God. So when you consider your laying yourself down on the altar as a living sacrifice, remember this. Human perfection has nothing to do with it. Human beauty has nothing to do with it. They were uncut, they weren't beautified. God wants the raw material ladies with no touch of what we think of as perfection. Because we don't really know what perfection actually looks like. Except through the word we do, we have the, the he's showing us the way, but guess who works that out? It's not us, it's him. The uncut stones weren't beautified because God wants the raw material he wants living sacrifices of the real human stuff of humanity. That's what he's asking for in this verse. So don't think about coming to this altar all cleaned up and neat. You come as you are. You know that little saying, warts and all. We come with the warts and all. You lay yourself down on that altar exactly as you are. And you give that self, this self, right here to him as a living sacrifice, which is your genuine expression of worship acceptable to God. That's acceptable to God. I don't understand it. I, I think he wants me all cleaned up. I think he wants me to wait until I've done certain things to get it all right, but he doesn't. Verse 1 in the message says it this way. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, 
and place it before him as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. See, it's what he does in us. We don't understand perfection. And we might get it even wrong. And we prob- and we actually, we do get it wrong. Because we think of perfection as saying all the right things and being like a little robot. That's not what it is at all. That's not what it is at all. So I love that. We take our everyday, ordinary life, our sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life. That's the life we lay down on that altar as a living sacrifice for God to use. Remember again the psalmist. What shall I give unto the Lord? I'll take the cup of salvation. I just take what he's already done. That's what it is. Verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now I want to spend a moment on this verse, because I think we get this verse wrong a lot of the time. And I think I used to get this verse wrong, and maybe some of you did as well or even still do i used to think that this verse was speaking more about like materialism being materialistic that's being worldly like it spoke of how you dressed or how you presented yourself what kind of car you drove or things like that and those kinds of things can speak of conformity to the world but i don't believe that's what's at the heart of this verse i don't believe that paul is talking here about the clothes that we choose or the colors that we put in our hair. I have a sweet friend that did put pink in her hair, which is my favorite color, and so I just love it. She did that recently, and I love it because it shows that creativity. And don't you love creative, creativity and creative people? I love that. You know, I'm such a conservative person by nature. And I remember years ago, I was going to a hairdresser, and um, she was not conservative. And she was very, you know, and I think she'd love to have done some crazy thing to my hair, but I came in and I remember her saying to somebody one day, the person next to her, oh, she's very conservative. It was kind of like she was saying, I am not going to be able to do anything really good here because (laughs) I got to do it really by the book. But I want to tell you why I was so conservative. And part of it's probably just the way I was raised and all the other stuff and just who I am. But I was also not free. I was not free. You know, creativity shows that you are free. Creativity shows that you are not conforming to the world. You're just doing you. You're just doing you. Now, conforming can mean materialism, to be sure. And what appears to be your creativity can be conformity. We see that a lot of times in the younger generation. You know, I'm just going to be me, and they do exactly whatever. They look exactly, they have exactly the right place for the piercing, you know, the right color hair. It's, you know, so sometimes it doesn't mean that. But you know what it is, ladies? It's really about motivation. That's the key right there. Why do you do what you do? And why do you wear what you wear? Why do you drive what you drive, etc.? We all have things in this world that we love and that we lean toward. That is not worldliness. And that's not conforming to the world. I went on a trip to Israel with my friend Cindy many years ago now. And we had a gal on the trip that I I just love this gal. But she and I are like um, polar opposites. She is just an outdoors person. She's a hiker. You know, I have a book. (laughs) You're out hiking. I'm probably reading something. And we're just like opposites and she's she you know her clothing showed it represented who she was now I'm a girly girl and I had this bathroom and it was actually in fact I think I dreamt that I still had that bathroom last night and that funny but it was kind of a silky bathroom I've never had a silky bathroom in my whole life but this one bathrobe that I got at TJ Maxx which is I've decided the only store we really need other than maybe the grocery store you can't get all of it there but that's what I've come to terms with I don't need any other stores but anyway I had gotten it at TJ Maxx and this was like lots of lots of years ago and um, it was Ralph Lauren so it had RL on it so this friend of ours came into our room and she says to me oh Ralph Lauren and I said oh Cabela (laughs) like she had her Cabela shirt on right and I had my Ralph Lauren robot. 
It's all the same thing because we, we wear the things we love. We do the things we love. Do you understand my point? The only reason I knew anything about Cabela was because my son-in-law is an outdoorsman. He's a, he's a bow hunter. You know, he's out there and he wears Cabela or he did at the time. I don't know if he still does. But anyway, it's like, yeah, I had on my Ralph Lauren bathrobe, but she had on her Cabela t-shirt. It's all the same. We all have things that we love. That's okay. We all have things that we lean into. That is not worldliness, and that is not conforming to the world. This verse isn't really speaking even about culture. It can be speaking about culture, but it's okay to fit in with the culture of the day. That's not necessarily conformity. Think about in Jesus' day, when we see a movie about Jesus, isn't everybody dressed the same? Right, because it's just how it is. It's, it's culture. That's just how things are. That's not necessarily conforming to the world. This verse isn't speaking about having things you love. Just because you have something that puts a smile on your face does not mean that you're conforming or that you're materialistic or anything like that. In fact, last week after study, a few of us were conversing when you guys went to your groups. We were talking about the beauty of the world that God gave us. God loves beauty. He knows that we love beauty. You know, look at the flowers. He didn't have to give us flowers. Look at the colors. Look at the beautiful trees, the birds. And I, I mentioned the fact that, you know, the parrots that you see, the colors are, it's almost like there's no other green like the green or the blue or the yellow on these birds. God made those things because he knows we like pretty things. That's okay. That's not conforming to the world. What this verse is speaking about is being part of the world system. It's when we begin to assess things as the world assesses them and find our self-worth in this world rather than in the kingdom. Wanting others to think that you're something that you aren't, that's conforming to the world. When you try to present yourself as something that you aren't. That is conforming. If you buy that blue sweater because you think it's just so cute, and blue is the color that everybody's wearing right now, and everybody else has a blue sweater, that's not conforming to the world. That's because you just think it's so cute and you want one too. Okay, that's okay. But if you buy the blue sweater because everyone else has one, you don't even really like blue, but everybody has one, and if you don't buy one, and you don't have one, you won't be cool, you won't fit in, that is conforming to the world. It's all about motivation. The whole thing about conforming is the why. Why, why do you do what you do? When we know who we are in Christ, we no longer need to strive to find or even to convince other people of our self-worth. Trying to convince other people that you're worthy, that's conforming to the world. Being who you are in Christ, that's being kingdom-minded. This is just who I am. Jesus through me, that's all I've got. That's being kingdom-minded. If you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then you can pretty much bet that you're living a transformed life. That is the transformation, ladies. Kingdom-minded, not worldly-minded. Sometimes it's hard to figure out which it is when you're having an emotion or you're having a thought or you're, sometimes it's hard to figure that out. Um, you know, even, you know, there's worldly ways to look at things and there's kingdom ways to look at things. It's, sometimes it's a fine line. But you pray, you seek first his kingdom, and you can always bring that idea in. Is this seeking first his kingdom? You know, is this edifying? Does this glorify my father? He wants us to be happy. He made beautiful things. That's all good. But when you do it for the wrong motives, then it's not. So how do we renew our mind? Okay, that's the question. It's very simple. We stay in the word of God. If you're not reading God's word, then you need to start reading it again. And sometimes we get out of, you know, sometimes we get into habits of things where for a while we were reading the word every day and now we're not. We'll get back into that because the, God's word is your plumb line. God's word keeps us kingdom minded. It doesn't matter what book you're reading. You can be reading Leviticus 
or you can be reading the Proverbs, or you can be reading a gospel. It doesn't matter. You're in his word. He has that opportunity to steer you and to keep you uh, with his plumb line. So we keep ourselves in God's word. If you're not in God's word, get back in there. We keep ourselves around God's people. It's so good to be around people who also love the Lord, and we keep ourselves accountable that way. You know, and sometimes we do it. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes somebody will say something to you. When I was a very new Christian, just beginning to walk, I was reading a book, and a friend of mine called me and said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm reading such and such. And she said, oh, Linda, you shouldn't be reading that book. It was a very worldly book. Now, that <laughs> didn't feel good at the moment, but I put that book away, and I, I recognized what she was saying to me. And I didn't pick up books like that again. I needed that, right? People are, that we keep each other accountable. Sometimes it's not like that. Most of the time, it's very rare that it's like that. Most of the time, we just hear somebody else talking, and they're talking maybe about something that the Lord showed them, and we're thinking, boy, the Lord isn't showing me anything. We get on our knees, and we start praying, and we start asking him, God, I want to hear from you. You know, we keep each other stirred up. You know, we do that with each other. So we keep ourselves in God's word. We keep ourselves around other people. We listen to godly teachings. That's what you're doing today. You're listening to a teaching out of the word of God. You, you do that on Sundays. Um, you know, you're reading maybe a book about something about the Lord. Or maybe, um, I know I've told you before, a lot of times I'll listen to podcasts. At night, I wake up a lot in the middle of the night, often. And I'll listen to a podcast of some of a godly teaching. So that's an opportunity to take in godly teachings. And we lay ourselves down on the altar as living sacrifices daily. Here I am, God. Here's my life. Use me. I've always said that when we come to Bible study each week, we get our heads straight. It's like it straightens us out. It's kind of like we're like horses that need blinders right? Because we start getting distracted. And then you come to Bible study and you're pulled back straight. When we get on our knees in the morning and we pray, we're pulled back straight. You know, sometimes you get on your knees and you're all just kind of, uh, and then you get up and you're at peace and you're in a different place. We go, we go to a prayer meeting or we go to, again, Bible study or we have godly fellowship. It keeps us in check. These things keep us in check, and they keep ourselves centered on Christ. Keep seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Keep laying down. Um, Sunday night at church, Greg talked about how we keep popping up. <laughs> you know, we just keep popping up. And he was talking about it in the sense of pride and how when we're, our, we're popped up, our heads are there, the enemy, we're like a good target for the enemy. You know, he can just see us. So he was saying, keep your head down. So, you know, we keep laying down. And you, if we do those things, we will keep being transformed. The Word of God is transformative. Living by the Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to fill you every day. These are the things that we do to be transformed. And we are in the process, ladies, of being transformed. Verse 3 goes on. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. This is having a transformed mind. This is such a great verse, and I'm just going to simplify it for us by saying, don't think too much of yourself, and don't think too little of yourself. Because isn't it usually one or the other? You either think you're just all there is, and you get everything right, um, at one moment, and five minutes later you think, I don't know anything, you know, <laughs> I'm just so stupid, or whatever we think, you know, that's what we do, but we need to think with the faith that God has given us, that's what that verse says, what does God say about you in his word, that's having sound judgment, don't go around thinking that you're better than other people, because you know what, you're just like everybody else, if the truth be known, you have strengths and you have weaknesses, if the truth be known, right? We're just like everybody else, a person in need of grace. And then on the other hand, don't go around demeaning yourself either. That is just as bad. I believe that's as bad as thinking too much of yourself. I think they're equally wrong. Stop all that degrading talk. If you're a person that talks degrading about yourself, stop it. It's a, it would, it'll be a discipline to stop that. 
oh, I'm just not, I'm, I don't know anything, I'm just, you know, that is not, that's not beneficial to anybody, and especially not to you. It can be a bad habit that needs to be broken. And sometimes we don't do it verbally, but we do it to ourselves. You know, you're, oh gosh, I can't believe I did that. I'm so dumb. I'm not smart. I'm not pretty. I don't know anything. I'm not worth anything. You know, all that, that is, that is so um, almost sacrilegious, I want to say, because you're worth everything. Because, because God gave everything for you. He gave his son for you. Do you think you're not worth anything? No, that's not true. That's a lie from the enemy. God gave everything for you. Speak out of that truth. That is having sound judgment when you recognize that. That is speaking according to your measure of faith. The trans, uh, Passion Translation says, God has given me grace to speak a warning about pride. I would ask each of you to be emptied of self-promotion and not create a false image of your importance. And again, that goes along with verse 2, not being conformed to the world. Seeking self-promotion is being conformed to the world, ladies. So if you're doing that, you know right there, that's we don't want to do that. Um, creating a false image of your importance, that is being conformed to the world. Those are no-nos. We don't want to do those things. Instead, honestly assess your worth by using your God-given faith as the standard of measurement. And then you will see your true value with an appropriate self-esteem. Self-esteem isn't wrong. It's not wrong to think good things about yourself. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm able to do this. I'm good at this. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So in other words, don't oversell yourself and don't undersell yourself. Just be the very best that you can be and trust the rest of the Lord. That's all we have is our best. You know, when I prepare a message, I'll say, God, this is, this is what I believe you've given me. So I'm giving what I think is, this is my best right here. You do the rest. All I have is my best. Ladies, all you have is your best. Just do your best. Verse 4, for just as we have many parts in one body, and all the body, all the body's parts do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually parts of one another. That verse 4 in the New Living says, says it this way. Just as our bodies have many parts, each part has a special function. That's why we can't try to be what this world says that we should be. Because we have a special function that the world knows nothing about and that they can't understand anyway. You know why? Because the world cannot appraise or discern spiritual things. That's 1 Corinthians 2.14. So stop trying to get your self-worth from this world because this world doesn't understand you in Christ. They understand you, you know, in your flesh, but they don't understand you in Christ. And they don't understand the function that God has created you to uh, achieve. And because we all have different functions in the body of Christ, I can't compare myself with you. And you can't compare yourself with me. You and I were created, every one of this, us in this room, were created to do different things. There's a different thing for every one of us. Now, we may have the same gifts, but our callings are different. We could have like 10 teachers in this room with different callings as to where that teaching gift will be fulfilled. So even if we have the same gifts, our callings are different. And we are called to accomplish different things in this world. Don't put your calling on me because I can't fulfill it. So if you look at me and you think, oh my gosh, yeah, she's a teacher, but she's, this, she's way over here. She should be, this is because I'm a teacher too, and this is how I teach. So that I, don't do that to me. Don't put your, your um, expectations on me. God is the only one that I have to please. I love you all. I love you all, but I don't have to please you. I only have to please God. And you know, when we are comparing ourselves to one another, I want to just say this, it's completely counterproductive. It gets us, it's another unbeneficial thing. Comparison separates. It's separating ourselves from one another. That's not good because we are part of one another. We are part of a whole. We need each other. 
exactly as we are. So I'm going to try really hard not to change you, and you leave me alone. <laughs> and every one of us will be like this. We're just going to be looking up and letting him show us what our gifts are and what our callings are and how to serve him as we are in this world. Now listen to this passage in the message. It says it this way, verses 4 through 8. In this way, we are like various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. Isn't that good? The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellent, excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let us just go ahead and be what we were made to be without comparison and without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something that we aren't. Isn't that powerful? Let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with others or trying to be something we aren't because that is conforming. That's when we're conforming. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you, if you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouragement and guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or, dis or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. And I love that. Don't get irritated and don't even get depressed. It's their, That person isn't your responsibility. That person's God's responsibility. You give what you can give. You know, we take things on that God never put on us. That's also, I think, conforming to the world. I think at its root, there's pride in that. We're going to fix everything. We can't fix anything unless God fixes it through us. So I just, I think that's important. Don't, if you're... If you're working with a disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them and keep a smile on your face. Go around with a smile. Smile at people when you see them. See, we all have different gifts given to us by our uh, just immensely creative Father in Heaven. He made me to teach and to encourage the body of Christ. He made my husband to have mercy and to give to those that he perceived were in need. He made some of you as prayer warriors. We have a group that meets on Fridays to pray. If you want to be, if you are a prayer warrior, and you want to be here 9.30 Friday mornings to pray and intercede over the body of Christ. He made some of you to serve. He made others to evangelize and others to open their homes in, to people in need. I don't do everything. You don't do everything. We all together fulfill the need. The body of Christ is beautiful and we need one another. I have a friend who's a great photographer who says that's not a spiritual gift. I'm just throwing that out there. We have it all, you know, neat, and it's like every single thing that is true is within this word. No, there's lots of things that are true that are just applied in here. Every single spiritual gift isn't listed. My daughter is exactly like her daddy. She's just a wonderful person, and um, she's wonderful to have around if you're in need, because she will have, she has this like prepared dinner that she takes to people, and I'm sure she makes other things, but she'll have lasagna at your door. If you're in need, there'll be, let, there'll be a salad and bread and always brownies. So that's what you're gonna get if you're in need. My daughter's wonderful to have around. Me, not so much. <laughs> it's not that I will never bring food to your house, but it will be very rare because she just does it. I have to think about it. I have to stop and think, oh, I should probably take a meal to that person. My daughter just, she's already got it there when that happens. And I'm just gonna say this one more thing about my daughter because I think it's so beautiful and I think it's just such a beautiful illustration. But she gave one of her clients her wedding dress for her client's daughter to wear at her wedding because they couldn't afford to buy her a dress. Who does that? The body of Christ. The body of Christ does things like that. That, ladies, is kingdom living. That is abundant life. Knowing that your future is absolutely secure so that you can live, you're free to live abundantly today. That's living abundantly. 
We should, that, if we're going to strive for anything, we should strive to be like Christ and live abundantly. Verse 9, we're moving on, and now we get to the Proverbs section of chapter 12, and we could call this next passage Kingdom Living 101. It's almost like Paul gives us the bullet, the bullet points of Christian living. And if we just really spend time on, on this passage, I don't have a lot of time left. Oh, I'm already over time. Um, if we spend time on this passage, you know, you, this is a passage you could read every day, and it would be beneficial to you. So I'm going to move through this quick. So verse 9 begins, and I'm giving it bullet points. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. I love that. A smile, a put on, an unloving heart, it just doesn't get it, does it? So love from the center of who you are. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing the second fiddle. We don't like the second fiddle, do we? Practice playing the second. Just intend to be the second fiddle sometimes. Don't burn out. Keep yourself fueled and aflame. Be alert, ser servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. In other words, use your gifts. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Shed tears with your friends when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be a great somebody. Don't be the great somebody. That is so tempting, but that is being conformed to the world. Don't do it. Don't hit back. I just think this is the message. I love it. Don't hit back. That's such a good line. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. And I love that, that part right there because in the New American Standard, it says, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You know, there, we, there are some relationships that we can't make peace in. We, we might try. You might go about it several different ways. There's a, a point where you just leave it in the hands of the Lord. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. I love that. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of that. Now, that can be a hard one because some of you have been harmed by others in a way that it's almost impossible not to want to take revenge. And I just want to say this little, this little caveat. If, there is, if you've been harmed by another in a way that is, has illegal, illegality involved, you need, that does need to be taken care of. You go you know, to the authorities if you need to. If that's too hard, go to a pastor, get counseling, talk to somebody. This, what Paul's talking about, isn't that. But if someone has hurt you deeply and everything in you wants to hit them back, remember, don't hit back. Give it all that you have, step aside, and leave room for God. That's what laying down your life as a living sacrifice looks like. Remember, God devises a way, and his ways to take care of things end up in a redemptive manner. He'll bring about perfect justice because he just judges righteously. Uh, 1 Peter 2.23, speaking of Jesus on the cross, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. I've leaned heavily on that verse in my life. It's a good one. It will support you as you step aside and leave the situation to God. Verse 20, our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go and buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you, but get the best of evil by doing good. Mm -hmm. The Passion says, never let evil defeat you, but defeat evil with good. That, ladies, that portion that we just read is what it looks like to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. That is kingdom living, and that is abundant living. And when we live wise, we're beautiful. Don't you see that in other people? When you live wise, you're beautiful. 
So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this passage of scripture that just gets us straight. It's like it pulls us back from the distractions and we see it, how to love, Lord, and how not to be defeated by evil. And I just want to pray especially for someone in this room today that has been harmed in a way that she just doesn't see how not to want to take revenge. Father, I pray for that one or that many, that you would give them the strength, Lord, the strength to lay themselves down as a living sacrifice, step aside and let you work. And I believe that there will be a praise report later to, because of that. And so, Father, we need your spirit. Fill us with your love. Lord, it's the Holy Spirit that sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. So we're asking today to give us your love, Lord, that we can live like this. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen.